¿Qué tal a todos? Muy buenos días. Gracias a toda la comunidad universitaria que se conecta en esta sesión Zoom, en este webinar que hemos iniciado desde la Facultad de Medicina de la UNAM en asociación con la Unión de Universidades de América Latina y el Caribe para todo el mundo prácticamente, gracias a los que se conectan y gracias por seguir estas charlas que tienen que ver con los retos de la educación médica en tiempos del COVID-19 y que el día de hoy estaremos platicando con un tema muy importante y relevante que tiene que ver con el impacto psicológico de la pandemia en la comunidad universitaria. Este esfuerzo conjunto es gracias a la UDUAL y a la Asociación Latinoamericana de Escuelas y Facultades de Medicina, la ALAFEM, y a su presidente, el doctor Germán Fajardo, agradecerle por esta iniciativa de mantener el diálogo, la comunicación, sobre todo en estos momentos difíciles en los cuales tenemos que estar haciendo teletrabajo, tenemos que estar desde casa, lo más importante, cuidando por la salud, pero lo más también importante es mantener este diálogo utilizando estas plataformas tecnológicas. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos a quienes están conectando a esta plataforma Zoom. Recuerden que tenemos traducción simultánea, por aquellos que quieran utilizarla en la parte de abajo, en los controles de Zoom, ustedes encontrarán un globo. En este globo ustedes pueden escoger el idioma español o el inglés. Tenemos traducción simultánea. Agradecerle al equipo técnico que está haciendo todas las gestiones para llevar esto a todas partes del mundo. Bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Pues sin más, iniciamos. Recuerden que también tenemos habilitado el chat para las preguntas y la retroalimentación con nuestros ponentes que tenemos, que van a hacer una extraordinaria y magistral intervención y son expertos además en salud psicológica. Bienvenidas y bienvenidos nuevamente, agradecerles a todos. Ahora le pediría por favor a nuestro secretario general de la UDUAL, el doctor Roberto Escalante, que pudiera darnos una bienvenida a este conversatorio. Adelante, doctor Escalante, bienvenido. Eh, Germán, muchas gracias, eh, muy buenos días. Eh, saludo muy cordialmente a toda la audiencia que, que amablemente ha escogido eh, escucharnos y vernos a través de estos medios digitales a lo largo de todos estos eh, meses eh, en los que hemos estado eh, transmitiendo eh, y discutiendo y analizando una eh, variedad de asuntos eh, relacionados con eh, los efectos de la pandemia en la universidad eh, y en la sociedad. Eh, en esta ocasión creo que tenemos la eh, gran oportunidad eh, de tratar un tema que sabemos que, que, que está ahí, lo mencionamos eh, con alguna frecuencia, pero creo que al, tal vez a mi juicio, no lo suficiente, eh, que es eh, los impactos eh, sociopsicológicos, yo diría, eh, que está teniendo eh, la pandemia. Las preocupaciones eh, centrales han estado enfocadas hacia eh, el número de contagios, eh, los decesos que ocurren, eh, el tema de las vacunas, eh, los impactos eh, económicos eh, sobre el empleo, la producción, el ingreso, eh, en fin, temas. Eh, efectivamente, todos ellos, sin duda, eh, muy relevantes, eh, pero creo que este, este, este tema de los impactos eh, psicológicos eh, que está teniendo la pandemia en la, en la población universitaria y meta eh, universitaria son de la mayor eh, de, 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 del mayor significado de la, de la mayor importancia creo que van a como los otros van a dejar una huella eh, eh, fuerte y tomará tiempo eh, reparar los eh, efectos de estos eh, de estos eh, de estos eh, de estos impactos eh, los seres humanos eh, creo que siempre hemos vivido mejor cuando estamos eh, eh, reunidos, cuando podemos reunirnos, cuando podemos vernos, cuando podemos tocarnos, cuando podemos mirarnos a los ojos, cuando po podemos interactuar cara a cara, eh, en lugar de esta sensación de estar eh, solo, eh, indefenso, eh, a merced de, de cosas que incluso no podemos 
eh, no podemos ni ver ni, control, ni, ni ver ni controlar. Entonces, eh, yo me congratulo que la, la FEM, esta aliada, esta organización aliada tan fundamental eh, de la UDUAL, eh, esté organizando esta serie de, de, de webinars y en este día uh, haya escogido este, este tema del impacto eh, psicológico en las comunidades eh, universitarias. Nuestros estudiantes, nosotros lo hemos constatado, eh, eh, no están bien, no, no se sienten bien, se sienten desesperados, eh, eh, están eh, solos eh, frente a la computadora por horas, eh, no están eh, aprendiendo adecuadamente. En fin, hay, hay toda una serie de, 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 de impactos. Eh, y esto en los que tienen las mejores, en mejores condiciones. Hay otros que, que porque la, la situación es heterogénea, hay otros estudiantes que están en condiciones realmente muy difíciles. Y afortunadamente eh, hoy tenemos eh, la oportunidad de contar con la opinión de eh, expertos muy connotados, mexicanos y, y no mexicanos, eh, que la LAFEM ha podido eh, congregar para esta, eh, para, para esta sesión. Eh, muchas gracias a todos ellos. Ya Germán se encargará eh, de presentarlos a cada uno de ellos, pero eh, a nombre de la UDUAL quiero saludarlos eh, muy cordialmente y agradecerles eh, que hayan aceptado la invitación que el doctor Germán Fajardo Dolci, presidente de la de la LAFEM les, eh, les turnó para que eh, participaran en este, eh, en este webinar. Creo que contar con esta eh, mirada de, de visiones eh, eh, en distintas partes del mundo, en Europa, en México, eh, nos va a permitir eh, saber cómo conocer cómo seguramente compartimos preocupaciones y problemas muy parecidos, pero habrá especificidades que también eh, será necesario reconocer. Así es de que creo que nos espera un webinar eh, muy interesante, eh, muy provechoso, eh, eh, para sobre todo poder tomar, eh, tomar medidas eh, eh, durante la pandemia y seguramente posteriormente a la pandemia para poder ayudar a, a nuestros estudiantes y a la comunidad en general universitaria eh, de estos impactos eh, psicológicos. Así es de que, por favor, Germán, adelante con la, con la, con la conducción. Eh, saludos a todos. Eh, muy buenos días. Gracias, doctor Roberto Escalante. Y nuevamente, bienvenidos a todos los que se están conectando a esta plataforma Zoom. Ya vemos que están participando en el chat. Recuerden habilitar su canal de audio. Tenemos español y tenemos inglés, traducción simultánea. Bienvenidos. Pues sin más, le vamos a ceder el uso a la doctora Marcia Eriat, que será la moderadora de este panel y que además ella es jefa de la División de Investigación de la Facultad de Medicina de la UNAM. Doctora, tiene usted ahora el, los micrófonos. Adelante y bienvenida. Muchas gracias. Eh, muchas gracias por invitarme a a estar al frente de, de este panel, sin duda alguna, muy interesante sobre el impacto psicológico de la pandemia en las comunidades universitarias a nivel global y a nivel de nuestra Facultad de Medicina de la UNAM. Tenemos eh, unos excelentes ponentes, como ya dijo el doctor Escalante, eh, el doctor Mar eh, Marco Somli, que es investigador principal de COVID Italia. Eh, este, como voy a hablar varias veces de este estudio, eh, de este estudio colaborativo COVID, eh, quiere decir Collaborative Outcome Study on Health and Functioning During, during Infection Times, COVID. Y es un gran proyecto de investigación internacional a través de cuestionarios online dirigido a toda la población de los países afectados por la pandemia de, de coronavirus, eh, la COVID-19. Este eh, en este proyecto participan casi 200 investigadores a nivel global 
y se ha reunido información de más de 100.000 participantes de más de 30 países en seis continentes y 25 idiomas. Entonces, es un esfuerzo colaborativo muy importante. Eh, el profesor Samuel Cortés es profesor de psiquiatría de la niñez y de la adolescencia encargado del COVID en el Reino Unido. El doctor eh, Bernardo Inch es investigador de COVID en México. El señor Andrés Estradé, investigador de COFIT en Uruguay y Reino Unido, y la doctora María Elena Medina Mora, jefa del Departamento de Psiquiatría y Salud Mental de la Facultad de Medicina de nuestra UNAM. Entonces, eh, le damos la palabra al doctor Marco Zombi. Actually, um, muchas gracias. Eh, buenos días. So, uh, Unfortunately, even though I'm, I can speak some Spanish because my wife is from Spain, um, my Spanish is not good enough to uh, give the talk in Spanish, so I will speak English. Um, so unfortunately, Dr. Solmi uh, cannot be here today, so I will give his talk on his behalf, and then I will give also my talk, so I will combine the two talks. So um, uh, uh, let me share my screen. All right. So uh, what I will do in my first talk of today is to first um, provide a general overview on the psychological impact of the pandemic on the academic population. Uh, second, I will highlight um, how um, the COFI study can allow us to understand, to better understand a number of aspects which are not um, included in other studies. And then I will uh, provide you with the main characteristic of the COFI study. So this is uh, the, the goal of my talk. And as I said, I'm very pleased to be here today. I'm very grateful because we are talking about a very important important topic, and uh, I do understand there is a large audience, so um, we are all learning uh, together how to um, manage, how to address this uh, huge crisis. So um, the more answers, the more contribution we will have for everyone around the world, the better uh, our understanding will be in terms of how to cope with this crisis and possible future pandemics. So um, uh, let's start, of course, from the topic of today. So the psychological impact of COVID-19 on um, academic uh, community in terms of students and also staff member of the university. So of course, there are a number of challenges and I guess we are all familiar with these. Uh, I would like just to remind some of them at least here. So the first is of course, uh, the shift from face-to-face -to, -face to um, online classes. And this has been um, a positive experience to some extent for at least some of us but we need to bear in mind that uh, some students don't have access to online um, facilities and arguably um, some type of teaching activities uh, are not suited to uh, online uh, delivery. The second major concern uh, is around the assessment and the evaluation of students. So that of course we have all been thinking over the past month how better to um, change our assessment system. And once again, uh, this may have been successful for some um, uh, cases, but in other cases and for other topics, it has been more problematic and not ideal. A, a particular mention should go to the international students. Uh, here in Europe, in the UK, we have a number, a high number of international students, and I guess this is the same for you. And some of them could not go back home. Uh, and this was compounded by a number of financial issues. 
uh, and uh, uh, practical issues around you know, housing, logistics. So all these, of course, contributed to their distress. Uh, of course, uh, we all know that uh, there have been uh, travel restrictions for um, teachers, researchers, so that um, the usual conferences and congress type were not possible. Uh, some of this has been replaced by online activity, but once again, uh, this did not come along with the uh, kind of social interaction, which is one of the most important aspects to build collaborations in the field in terms of research. And finally, of course, we need to bear in mind that um, a student, university students are a subgroup of the population, which is particularly vulnerable to um, uh, distress, to uh, mood and anxiety issues uh, due to the pressure uh, from the academic system. And of course, uh, um, anxiety around the virus and the financial impact of the current situation, but also looking ahead in terms of possibility of working after university, of course, increased, contributed to increase the stress, the anxiety level. So um, these are just some of the aspects, of course. Um, so here in this uh, slide, you can see um, a table which summarizes um, just a, a review of the literature that I put together last week. And uh, I appreciate it's not uh, comprehensive. Uh, so I just uh, looked at the published studies in peer review journals mainly in the field of um, medicine, psychiatry, and psychology, studies around empirical studies, around the impact, the psychological impact of COVID-19 on the academic community. And of course, a number of these studies are ongoing, so they have not been published yet. So this probably, this table is not comprehensive. However, as you can see, not surprisingly, the majority of these studies uh, comes from um, China, but there are also studies around the world. And as you can see from the topic of these studies, uh, the majority of these studies have assessed the prevalence. So I tried to understand how common the problem of the psychological impact on the student is. Only a minority of them, as you can see, have also assessed possible uh, intervention or, or management strategies. And this is quite understandable because we're talking about recent phenomena. So uh, usually we first describe something and then we try to understand how to deal with this. Uh, so the majority of these studies, when we go and look and read them uh, carefully, uh, uh, those who have uh, assessed the prevalence of the psychological impact have, uh, in the majority of the cases, uh, uh, focus on two um, issues, so anxiety and depression. This, of course, is important, but there are also other mental health aspects and other aspects of function or quality of life that have not been always systematically included in these studies. And also other conditions, for instance, neurodevelopmental disorder, autism, spectrum disorders, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorders. So there are a number of uh, aspects that have been quite downplayed so far in current research. Second, when we look at the treatment, uh, definitely these are quite um, modest studies because of course we don't have the time yet to conduct rigorous uh, trials, which will allow us to understand really which is the best way to manage this. So these are preliminary um, feasibility studies, initial studies, and they have focused on a number of different approaches which would deserve more attention in the future, such as mindfulness, physical activity, um, and also peer support. So all these, as I say, we will be able to better understand which treatment to deliver, which strategy, once we better understand the risk factors and the protective factors for 
uh, the um, mental health conditions in this population. So um, these studies that have been conducted so far are uh, remarkable in a way, and we should really consider that they, they have been conducted in a very challenging um, time period. However, they do present a number of limitations that don't allow us to fully understand um, the risk and the protective factors to uh, implement intervention strategies. So these are um, first the fact that, as I mentioned, most of them, they focus just on one single disorder, mental disorder. Second, in terms of design of the studies, these studies were what we call cross-sectional, or uh, in, I think in Spanish, yeah, transversal, which means so we, we take a picture, a snapshot in one time point, or some of them, they took a, a kind of picture in two close time points. But definitely what we need to know better is how uh, the situation changes over time, over the months, in relation to changes, for instance, in uh, lockdown procedures and policies from different states. Uh, third, um, actually, if you look at the studies published so far, the majority of these has a focus on the students. But of course, when we think of the academic community, this entails much more than the students. Uh, so all the other uh, actors. In, the, in academia and university. Fourth, um, interestingly, uh, most of these studies focus mainly on the risk factors for uh, mental conditions. Few of them have addressed the protective factors. And once again, if we want to implement preventive and early treatment strategies, we do need to understand better also the risk, uh, not only the risk, but also the protective factors. And finally, um, basically almost all of these studies have been conducted locally. So let's say in one university or in a, in a few universities in one country. So uh, this is of course understandable, but uh, it is important to have uh, a study which address targets different countries around the world, because it is important to compare the findings across countries to understand how different ways of dealing with the pandemic from the government may have had a different impact on the outcome. So um, when I mentioned the beginning that we are learning together how to um, cope with the pandemic, we can learn better, not only uh, from our neighbors, but also from people who are quite far. Even if we could think at the beginning, well, I don't care, I live in Mexico, uh, you know, I don't care what's happening in, in the UK. Actually, it's always interesting to see, uh, to have a more global approach to better understand uh, things. Right, so, um, so this is the reason why uh, today we are uh, talking about COVID. The, 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 the acronym for this study has already been introduced by my um, colleague. And uh, so COVID stands for a Collaborative Outcomes Study on Health and Functioning During Infection Time, COVID. So the, the name was made to um, be similar to COVID in a way. So um, what is COVID? So COVID is basically is an online anonymous survey which aims to better understand the impact of COVID on the mental and physical health, including well-being of individuals across the population from childhood to adulthood and across countries. And as I said, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, the PIs, the principal investigators of these studies uh, could not be here today due to overlapping commitments. So they asked me as a coordinator of the UK 
um, a coffee to, 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 to talk on their behalf and, and very grateful for, for this opportunity. But I think uh, I would really like to introduce them because they, they did and they're doing a huge amount of work day and night, I would say, for this uh, study. So uh, these are Professor Christoph Corral, who is uh, an international leader in psychiatry and is working, actually is one of those uh, uh, amazing people who are able to work in different countries. So he, he works in the United States, but also in Germany, where he's from. And the other fantastic colleague is Dr. Marco Solmi from the University of Padua, Italy, so actually close to my hometown, Verona in Italy. So we had a particular feeling and um, is doing a massive amount of work for this. So um, just to give you an idea actually of how a COVID has evolved over time, at the beginning, when we look at uh, basically, uh, you know, when he started the 1st of April, um, there were only two continents involved, but then today there are six continents involved. So okay, imagine, just imagine the amount of work that is entailed. At the beginning, there were only two available languages. So United, um, English and Italian, because the two investigators were from the United States and from Italy. Now we do have the survey available in 29 languages. And a lot of colleagues have made a lot of efforts to translate and back translate this. Uh, so now from two countries, we have more than 100 countries around the world. And from two institutions, we have more than 50 institutions supporting this survey. And in terms of um, participants as a researchers, uh, from the initial number of two researchers, now we have more than 200 researchers. And you know, a way to measure the impact, the scientific impact of a researcher is um, through the H index, which gives an idea of how um, cited their work is in the scientific community. And so we have a global H index of 3000, which is just a stellar. So is this survey is really um, conducted by um, experts in the field. So um, how does it look like, uh, practically speaking? So uh, basically, uh, this is the website. Uh, you have the link here. And you can select the language. Uh, and uh, you can have a look at all the different features of um, the website. And then, uh, you, as I say, you can select one of these languages and then you can take the survey. The survey takes around uh, 30 minutes to be completed by adults. So we do appreciate it's not short, but the reason is that to understand really how to um, implement um, solid uh, policies and um, procedures, it is important to have a deep understanding. You cannot really understand the phenomenon with a two minute survey. So I know that there are some people who are quite impatient. They cannot stay more than um, five minutes on a survey. So there is a, a way to stop and go back to the survey if you cannot sit down for more than 20 minutes. I'm saying this because my area of expertise is around um, ADHD. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So I had a number of patients of myself who told me it was very difficult to complete the survey, but you should know that you can pause and then uh, start again. So let's go then really in, in detail, uh, the heart of COVID. So what does it aim to achieve? So basically, as I mentioned, it's a survey on uh, four different aspects. So it's on the general mental health, the general physical health, the overall functioning, social functioning, and the quality of life. All these are, of course, uh, interrelated. There will be an, a lot of outcomes, a lot of um, things that we will understand from COVID, but mainly the two main um, outcomes, as we say in, in research, are uh, the P-score, which is a, a score, a number, which tell us about the level of psychopathology, and a well-being score, 
which is tell us, you know, um, is a summary of well-being. And what, what, what else do we want to understand? We want to understand the risk factors and the protective factors that um, impact on this. When it comes to risk factors, there are mainly two types of risk factors, those that can be changed and those that unfortunately uh, cannot uh, be changed. So definitely um, those that can be changed are more of interest in terms of prevention. So there are some uh, things that cannot be changed. Your biology, for instance, quite difficult. But others such as, you know, behavioral um, aspects, emotional aspects, COVID-19 related aspects, all these can be changed. And so if we understand these protective and risk factors, we will be able to implement prevention, early intervention and promotion of health. And so uh, it is not an academic study just for the sake of publishing it for our career. As I say, you know, we are all quite experienced. We don't need another study in our CV. It's a study which is really meant to be helpful for those who need to make decisions in, uh, for the society. Um, so having taken a closer look at uh, the survey. So if you are an adult, as I say, it, it's a study not only for adults, but let's say if you are an adult, so um, if you are a, an academic uh, staff or a student, and by the way, I was saying that um, COVID, of course, is not just a survey for students, but it's interesting that it is addressed to all the population because you know students live in families, in groups, in social groups, they have social groups. So of course, to understand their well-being, we need to understand also people around them. So um, when we try to understand uh, the well-being of students, it is quite uh, you know, uh, not accurate, not convenient to limit the survey to students. So this is why COVID is open to everybody, but we can use the results of COVID also to understand the impact on students. So uh, in terms of adults, so when you uh, are an adult, you go on the website, you need to consent, even if it is anonymous, of course, uh, you need to consent. Then there is an option to leave, uh, to um, choose what we call the household code. What does, what is it and why do we need this? Since the survey is anonymous, we are not able to link different names of people in the, in, in the same family. So there is a code which identifies uh, the unique family. So we will be able to put together um, the service for different members of the same family, uh, thanks to this number. Then if you are an adult, there is an option that if you have children, you can uh, complete a preliminary questionnaire on well-being and the psychological aspects in children. And then finally, you can take the survey uh, for, um, as an adult, which uh, actually is um, a number of questions that we did not uh, create ourselves because this would have entailed a lot of time. It's not easy to create a questionnaire in psychiatry, psychology. So what we did is to take questions from existing questionnaires. These are, um, for those who work in the field of psychiatry, are very familiar questionnaires. And as you can see here, they focus not only on anxiety, depression, as I was saying, but also on a number of other important aspects. For instance, obsessive compulsive disorders, resilience, which is very important, and so on and so forth. And of course, if, you, uh, if a child or an adolescent wish to participate, then they can do so. Actually, there are three uh, main uh, streams for uh, COVID, the adult, the adolescent, and the child version, uh, up to uh, starting from six year, six. So um, adolescent and children can take a, a, a shorter version of COVID. They, have, they can complete themselves some questionnaires, 
And the, 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 the adolescent version is very similar to the adult versions. Uh, um, only the, the items around sexual activity have been removed. And the version for children is short, of course, is around 10, 15 minutes, because of course, uh, we cannot ask a child to stay on a questionnaire for 30 uh, minutes or more. And it's very important also to have data from children. Uh, so um, just to conclude with some um, data at the international level, and then my colleagues will provide you with more um, in-depth description of what's happening in, in Latin America in general and Mexico in the third talk more specifically. So, so far um, we have uh, actually uh, collected a large number of answers or uh, responses. An important point to appreciate is that there are two ways we uh, recruit um, people in this study. So the first one is um, what we call a non-probabilistic snowball approach. What does it mean? So basically word of mouth. So, you know, hey, there is this questionnaire. Can you complete it? We post on Twitter, we post on Facebook, uh, we send it to colleagues via email and so on and so forth. This is a good strategy to have good numbers, but it does have a limitation that, of course, only a selected type of individuals will uh, answer the questions. So in addition to these very um, general um, uh, strategies, we have also what we call a, a probabilistic uh, sample. And I will come back to this in a minute. So um, using Twitter, Facebook, uh, word of mouth, um, emails, a newspaper, um, in, you know, um, television, we were able to have a total of more, almost 92 participants in COVID. And you can see here uh, the, the ratio between uh, males and females. So actually more uh, females have participated and different from different um, um, population segment of the populations. And um, some of them, they had uh, diagnosed mental health disorders, but only a 14%. And 10 of them had been in touch with a person with COVID-19. And, uh, and 14 of them, they had been in quarantine. So um, as I said, uh, this is okay. And this is what we would really like um, all participants to do, to take the survey themselves and to prompt family members, friends, colleagues to take it. However, we are mindful of the fact that to conduct a, a seriously uh, conducted and rigorous study, we also need to sample the population in a more representative way, because other way, otherwise the critique will be, you just got uh, you know, the participants, those who are keen on taking part in the study. So in addition to this effort, we are also um, contacting professional um, companies, which conduct surveys, sampling the population, taking a random and representative sample of the population. And so far this has been done in adults uh, in these countries and also in children in Italy. So uh, I will stop here just showing the last slides, uh, just you know, as a visual uh, message, all the number of organization and uh, supporters that we have. And I would like to stress that we are conducting this study with very limited amount of funding. So all these, um, the, my colleagues here on the on the call today, Bernardo and, um, and, and Strade have been um, doing this in their spare time for free and, and doing this basically for, for free as well. So um, this is because we really think that uh, it's a major priority right now. Um, and we, of course we are seeking for funding uh, of course, uh, but there are a number of associations, you know, very important association, the World Psychiatric Association, Association for Children, and these are all the universities. I could go on for hours, but just you know, to give you an example, uh, from the um, Latin America, we have a number of partners, 
And so what we are looking for is to increase this number of partners. And especially we would like to ask you, because each of you I think is in a unique position to uh, contribute to um, circulate the serving in Latin America. And you, you will see the numbers are quite okay, but we can do better, definitely. And as I say, the more we have, the more accurate and rigorous our study would be and better way we will be able to help um, people uh, in, during the pandemic. So uh, I think I will stop here and I will ask um, uh, Andres, who um, has been working, uh, has put a, an amount of work which has been incredible on this study, probably to go ahead and then Bernardo. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Eh, muchas gracias, muy interesante. Eh, eh, entonces va a seguir el, Thank el... you very much, Samuele. This was very interesting. We will give the floor to Andrés Estrade and then Dr. Bernardo Nig. Andrés, you have the floor. First of all, thank you very much. We are switching to Spanish now. I will try not to speak too fast. I will do my best to slow down in order to contribute to the simultaneous interpreting. I will start by sharing my screen. I will try to be brief because we know that uh, when we participate through Zoom, we experience the tyranny of time as uh, happens in a real life presentation. So I will try to be brief. I will simply like to share with you some data that has to do with uh, South America. By the comments that we have received uh, through the chat, I see that we have people participating from South America. So it's interesting to see that we have people listening not only from uh, Central and America, for, but also from South America. We have several collaborators in Brazil, Chile, Colombia, and Uruguay. They are all working very actively in the COVID project. And we also have several universities representing these countries. So we have a very nice representation of researchers as part of this project. In South America, It, it's in South America is interesting for several reasons. Several uh, South American countries uh, are included amongst the countries with the largest number of cases and deaths. This is according to the Johns Hopkins uh, monitoring data. Brazil ranks second regarding the number of cases and deaths. Colombia ranks sixth in number of cases, but at the same time, we have a quite uh, diverse and heterogeneous uh, situations from the arrival of the pandemic around March in, in South America. Some countries have implemented quite loose measures regarding the lockdown as in Brazil. Other countries have implemented more stringent uh, measures that have been maintained for months, as is the case of Argentina. But we are speaking about very large countries. So within each country, we have a lot of uh, internal heterogeneity among the different states or provinces. Uruguay, I'm uh, from Uruguay. Uh, this is where I'm based now. We are a very small country. Their population is 3 million. But uh, let me tell you that Uruguay implemented a volunteer quarantine or lockdown that was uh, done on a voluntary basis. It was never mandatory, but this also shows the heterogeneity, it's a proof of the heterogeneity of the measures that have been implemented. So that's why it's uh, interesting to have uh, samples and participants from different parts of uh, Latin America to show how the different uh, modalities uh, may have diff a different impact on mental and physical health. This is the data of uh, 
participation in COVID in South America. Almost 10,000 people have participated so far by answering the survey from uh, Colombia, Brazil, Chile, and Uruguay, which are the countries that are actively promoting this uh, COVID study. But there are participants from other countries as well. There is little published about the impact of the pandemic on mental health in Latin American countries. In Uruguay, some data have been released, but not from uh, arbitrated publications, like Samuel mentioned initially. We have data from the Ministry of Health in Uruguay, an online psych psychological care uh, service was established. Since uh, the very beginning, we have received around 100,000 calls. This is a large number considering that we have a small population. And uh, these similar efforts were implemented in other countries. And uh, some of the major reasons for calling these uh, mental health lines were anxiety, distress, uh, an increase in alcohol consumption has also been uh, reported uh, among different population groups that include students. At the level of um, student education, well, it was all moved to virtual classes. This uh, continues to, to be uh, going right now in Uruguay. We have a very uh, diverse uh, populations participating. We have 18% uh, a, a of people who reported being in contact with COVID-19 people, 18% uh, in under quarantine, and 2% uh, reported having a diagnosis of uh, uh, COVID-19. This is uh, a screenshot of the COVID study in South America. And of course, that any of you living in any uh, Latin American country are invited to participate in the study. I don't want to take more, more of your time. So I will end my brief presentation about COVID in South America now. And uh, let me now give the floor to Bernardo who will speak about the COVID study in Mexico. Many, many thanks. This was very interesting, Andres. Bernardo Nig has the floor now. Many thanks. Good morning. I would first of all like to thank for this invitation. My last name is pronounced in Spanish NG. It's a Chinese last name without vowels. It's difficult to pronounce. So it's pronounced in Spanish as NG. On behalf of the Mexican Psychiatry Association that I chair, I would like to say that it has been a privilege for us to participate in this study. As you have already heard, this is a very ambitious project. And I would like to share with you the results of what we have done in Mexico so far regarding COVID. Regarding on COVID-19 based on the Johns Hopkins data shared by Andres, as you know, we have ranked between the third and the fourth position regarding the number of deaths compared to the rest of the countries worldwide. We have had a public health policy for handling uh, COVID that has been much criticized by some. It has been well accepted by others. But as Andres said, every country is uh, different. Mexico is a very large country. And uh, I see that we have uh, gone from uh, disbelief all the way to denial until we saw an alarming increase in the number of deaths. There has been, uh, then came fear, uncertainty, and uh, both 
for students and not students, this is very important, the uncertainty. This applies to people who have uh, lost their job or who were not able to migrate to telework or to virtual work and I are facing a very difficult situation. And a reflection about something that is very humane, but at times it becomes the only way to cope with an overwhelming reality. I'm referring to apathy. It was said that at this point of the pandemic in Mexico, some people were not uh, complying with the recommended measures of using a, a face mask and uh, going to public places without a face mask and the proper protection, which represented a risk of increasing the number of cases. But uh, all of this highlights the importance of participating in the survey, because as was said originally, as Samuel said, this will be the source of the data that will help us later see what should be the preventive measures that we need to implement. And most of all, what will be the measures that will allow us to reinsert ourselves into the society. Let me start by addressing fear. Many people have experienced fear of, of becoming infected. There is a new entity that has been proposed, which is a post-COVID stress syndrome. It's a, a condition that is characterized by stress symptoms. I would like to highlight uh, what are the characteristics of COVID uh, stress syndrome. It's characterized by the fear of becoming infected, but it is also characterized by xenophobia. You may well remember that uh, coronavirus came from China and many Asian people were being discriminated against. This was uh, in uh, in Vancouver, where there is a large Asian population. This also happened in Mexico with uh, people traveling from Europe to Mexico, particularly from uh, Spain. And unfortunately, xenophobia occurred in Mexico, but this was uh, targeted against or targeted to the healthcare workers. At the Mexican Psychi Psychiatric Association, together with other institutions, we implemented a program called We Also Take Care of Ourselves. This has led to an increase in mental health support services um, that are available for all healthcare workers, from physicians all the way to nurses, to cleaning or housekeeping staff. Of course, we know that this is uh, not new and uh, we will later see whether the COVID stress syndrome remains as a clinical entity or not. There is another topic had, that has also been very frequently discussed in scientific and medical publications. It's what is called Zoom-itis or Zoom-related fatigue. We know that Zoom is not the only available platform, but it is uh, the most widely used one. It is estimated that it has 300 million users per day. And there is a pathophysiologic uh, explanation or that uh, tries to explain why those of us who are constantly participating through Zoom or uh, for academic purposes, for social purposes, or even for clinical purposes, it seems like we end up feeling much more tired than uh, we did on a regular day when we would go to the hospital, to our office, to a, a meeting, etc. We had to cope with the uh, traffic, with commuting. But it's, so, it's ha now happening that even though you stay at home, you're not going out, you're not out in, in traffic, you have a uh, Con being contacting or speaking with people from all over the world and you end or, and even with patients but you end up feeling much more uh, tired it, it, some of the physiological explanations include a delay in the audio that leads you to having to be much more concentrated and the reward system is simulated as well 
we have had to adapt to the video conferences because uh, our brain does not react as it does when you have a face-to-face -face interaction. In order to speak to you as an audience, I'm not seeing you, I have to look at the green dot on my camera, and uh, this requires a different type of concentration. You need to be careful with your, your movement, you have to watch your camera. You, at times, you can't look at the faces of other people who are gathered, but this is much more exhausting. Apart from this, we are paying attention to the meeting, but we are involved in multitasking. We are looking at our cell phone, we are reading emails and so on. And lastly, the fact that we are leading a much more sedentary lifestyle than before, even those of us who don't work in areas that uh, are located outside of our office. I will close with um, by sharing with you data about Mexico. Given that Andres shared with you the data for South America. Of course, that uh, I would like to clarify that uh, we are updating our service. We are changing our data so that Mexico does not appear as part of South America. This is something that we Mexicans really don't like to be uh, included in, as part of South America because we are located in North America. I would like to encourage you to log in our uh, and participate in the COVID study. At the webpage of the Mexican Psychiatric Association, we have a video that explains what the survey is about. It's uh, more or less what Samuel already explained to you. I would like to, to emphasize the fact that we need thousands of participants in Mexico to have a representative sample. We have uh, 690 people who have participated in the survey so far. 25% of them are healthcare workers, 41% reported having a medical condition, and 22% reported having a mental diagnosis. 24% reported having been in contact with someone that was COVID positive, and 3% have had a diagnosis of COVID-19. Based on the numbers that we have about the about the cases and the deaths, this sample is of by no means representative. We would like for it to become representative. I would like to thank the the team at uh, the Mexican Psychiatric Association with Dr. Telma Sanchez, Dr. Roman, Dr. Heriberto Peña, Dr. Arellano. Thanks to them, it was possible to get the approval of the Ethics Committee and to launch the COVID survey. I think this is my last slide. So at this point, I would like to close by thanking you for your attention. And uh, we will continue. Thank you, Bernardo. This uh, was extremely interesting. Let's now give the floor to Dr. Maria Elena Medina Mora. She has the floor. First of all, many thanks for this invitation. Thanks for the opportunity to participate with you in such an interesting project that you have shared with us. I will tell you about what has been done in Mexico, emphasizing the student population, the college students. I would like to start by telling you what is going on with uh, youths in Mexico. We are seeing that the impact of the pandemic sort of follows growing problems. And so this is uh, they are evolving in the same direction. I will uh, refer to studies that have been done about COVID-19 that has to do have to do with prevalence, but also special aspects uh, regarding the healthcare workers, those that are at the front line, including undergraduate students, then who is seeking help and what should we do trying to improve the well-being of the college students. To begin with, let me say that the 
This is what is happening with the youngsters in Mexico. This is based on an international study that I will later share with you. The youths throughout the, the world are going through a difficult situation. We see substance use problem. And this is what happens in Mexico. We This is data from the two most recent addiction survey. We have data of our National Institute of Statistics that report the number of uh, suicides. The populations ages 15 to 29 is the most affected one. The population ages 20 to 24 is the one with the most suicides. The major cause of death among this age group, uh, ages 15 to 29, is uh, violence. Um, then followed by suicide. It's ranked second among causes of death in the group 15 to 29 years. This is a population that is much affected. We see that mental disorders are also growing in this population group. In this uh, psychiatric epidemiology survey that is part of the a world survey conducted by WHO, we conduct, interviewed uh, young people in 2001. Then we had a sample of uh, teenage adolescents and that we followed them up. I'm showing how youths were in 2001. And then in 2013, we see an increase in the number and the proportion of those affected with mental disorders. This is a psychopathology or mental diseases in college students. This is from 13 universities that have been working on this. They do a survey in students when they come to the first semester. These are the results of seven of them. This was headed by Dr. Benjet. We see a lot of mental disorders in the college population that include the problems that worry us all, suicidal ideations, the difference between males and females. Among females, we have more depression and anxiety. Among males, we have uh, substance abuse, behavioral disorders. This is seen in college students. This is a comparison of the international group headed by Dr. Auerbach showing the situation for different countries where the survey was uh, implemented. In uh, yellow, we show Mexico. We are the country before last regarding the prevalence of any mental disorder among college students. But look at the age of onset, which is quite young in all countries. It is around 14 years during adolescence. So our university also has high school, so we are very concerned. And we know that we need to approach all of these very young people so that they can have a proper diagnosis and treatment so that they can continue in college. Prior to COVID, this is in one of these surveys. It, it should say, Technology-based treatment, not ideology-based treatment. That's a, a typo, a typo of the slide. This is this shows the treatment delivery preferences associated with the type of mental disorder. This was done in seven Mexican universities, and 55% uh, of them answered a, the questionnaire. 69% of them reported preferring face-to-face -face treatment, and only. 31% said uh, they could uh, have a phone uh, consultations. But when the pandemic began, the adherence of students to mental health services uh, became a challenge. I'm showing you a program with the participation of the School of Psychology and uh, other associations within the university. They, they all provide care to college students. They provide education, stress reduction services, uh, daily activities, functioning uh, uh, guidance, psychological treatment, uh, and referral to specialists or to the hospital. 
This service has 30 sites, 11 of them for first contact or primary care, 11 for follow up or supervision. And they provide these services based on the factors that we have uh, found to be as a major reasons for seeking care. This is a program that had been going on for several years prior to the pandemic. More than 5,000 students had uh, been uh, screened. They are invited uh, to participate uh, through the social media so that they can participate in this network they are first screened based on the results of the screening they are offered their required treatment. During the pandemic, we uh, contacted more than 16,000 uh, students, most of them requiring psychosocial interventions or requesting uh, uh, information. But 846 requested assistance, 829 provided the, and they gave their consent, and 829 received some kind of uh, mental health care. This is a project coordinated by Dr. Silvia Morales Laine and includes a branch for the general population. More than 110,000 people have participated. And there is a system coordinated by the Ministry of Health throughout the country so that people can be referred to treatment to 300 centers taking care of uh, substance abuse. We have other uh, mental health care centers, the Centers for Youth Integration. And uh, we have people participating on the voluntary basis, including the Mexican psychiatric association this way so that people can get the care they need. Let me elaborate on the healthcare staff because this provides us with information about the students. This begins with an online screening. Based on the results of the screening, there is a personal contact established with a therapist. There is a virtual uh, communication with the, the therapist. But let me share with you the data of the people who have participated. I said we have a, a bit more than 10,000 people who have participating in this mental health monitoring system. As expected, the major problem is uh, that of healthcare workers on the front line. They have a depression, 37.7% of them. If we compare males and females, females are much more affected by depression. Female will have uh, mood disorders like anxiety disorders and males have uh, problems that have to do, do with alcohol use and substance use. This 30% total prevalence of uh, mental health uh, problems among uh, healthcare workers is similar to the one reported by a telephone survey. They reported 30%. But if we break this down to consider and to go down to the students, and let me repeat that the survey was not conducted among uh, only national university students. No, this included the uh, healthcare staff uh, working at all hospitals in the country. In among undergraduates from universities that have not approved for students to work at COVID hospitals, they have higher levels of depression, suicidal ideations, and alcohol use. In this analysis, residents uh, are grouped with the general practitioners. They rank second regarding the prevalence of depression, alcohol use, generalized anxiety, and high risk of uh, burnout. And the other type of staff practicing at hospitals, they are specialists. They face uh, health anxiety, somatization, uh, generalized anxiety, and increase in tobacco use. What happens after the screening? Well, depending on the type of uh, disorder and on whether they want to get treatment or not, they are referred to different types of institutions. 
we have uh, three hospitals in Mexico City, the National Institute of Psychiatry, the National Institute of Respiratory Disease, The National Institute of Respiratory Disease is the major COVID hospital in Mexico City, so they refer people to the National Institute of Psychiatry. Something else that we did at the Psychiatry and Mental Health Department is a, a survey, very interesting survey, on how the healthcare staff was found to have high depression rates. What we did was to change our system to provide care to the uni college community to provide online care. We designed a system or we established a system that allowed us inviting people who can log in. They ask for an appointment, they get an appointment, and this system is linked to the electronic medical record then there is a screening questionnaire for them. The department has three clinics. One is on gender violence that has an impact on mental health, substance abuse, and psychiatry and mental health. They are referred to treatment and they, we have developed a system uh, for prescriptions of a prescri for prescribing prescription drugs. Once they log in our platform, they are monitored for quality control purposes and to determine how technology is being used. From March to August, when we have the latest data, we had 563 under treatment, 5, 1,563 under treatment. That is to say, 63% of those who requested an appointment, and they represent 72% of them are females. Major problems are those that we expected. First of all, depression, together with anxiety, post traumatic stress symptoms that start to come up. We have seen important changes as the epidemic has moved ahead. We see alcohol use problems, sleep problems, and suicidal ideations. We are uh, quite concerned because one third of them have had a suicidal attempt. Which are the risk factors? We have mentioned uh, many of them. Let me share with you data that have to do with violence and um, suicidal attempts. Many uh, college students were worried because they might not be able to continue studying because of the economic situation. We saw that violence increased during the lockdown. This was associated with economic problems uh, of the family. Alcohol use and suicidal attempts were associated with economic problems and violence. And the decrease in income was associated with violence, post-traumatic stress syndrome, depression, and suicidal attempts. It is very important to target these risk factors and to assist college students to overcome and cope with these and other risk factors that increased during the lockdown. Conclusions, young ages represent a risk stage in Mexico and all over the world. The age group, this age group coincides with the college ages. So it is important to know what are the needs of college students and so that they can end their uh, college uh, successfully. It is important to know what are the needs to, we know that the pandemic has had an important impact on mental health. We would like to get information so that we can prepare better programs. We know that college students are not free of all of these impacts. We know we are aware of the, of the fact that healthcare workers are at a special risk. They're facing spe special risk factors. This has led to the presence of burnout and uh, there have been impacts resulting from the healthcare workers seeing the death of so many people and people who are close to them. We are also aware of the fact that there are successful interventions that we have tested and seen. And we know that technology has allowed us to 
take care of the needs of our students. We are trying to determine what problems did students have, those that requested uh, online assistance but did not get it. This might have been due to technology problems or lack of technology available. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Medina Mora, for such an interesting presentation. We have received several questions from the audience. I don't know if all of you would like to turn your video on for the Q&A session. The first question is addressed to Dr. Cortese. How do you handle the information that you get from the COVID study? How are you handling the data? Right. Um, thank you for this question. It's important. So the data, which, as I said, are anonymous, are stored, centrally stored in a server in Italy, uh, because, as I mentioned, uh, one of the two uh, PAIs are, uh, is in Italy, Dr. Solmi. And then uh, we have a team of experts in statistics who have implemented um, a, a scripts in uh, the software R, which is a commonly used uh, freely available software in, st in statistics to um, um, analyze the data. So basically um, there is a central uh, um, management, but also each country then has access, of course, to the data for the production and dissemination of papers, scientific publications, which are a focus on that particular country. So this is the general overview of how we handle data. And maybe um, Andres, you may want, and Bernardo, you may want to add uh, other aspects related uh, to, to the statistical analysis in your countries. Um, hola, bueno, sí, gracias por la, por la pregunta. Yes. Uh, thanks for this question. As Samuel mentioned, it is important <clears throat> to make sure that data are kept anonymous and that they are stored safely in uh, the servers in Italy. Global statistical analyses will be carried out with a global sample, and then the different countries and the different researchers with their local teams in the different countries will be able to carry out local analysis at a second stage. This will be done in the future. Initially, the, we will ha the data will be analyzed at the macro level. Of course, always respecting and uh, maintaining the privacy and the safety uh, security of the data. Thank you, Dr. NG had uh, to leave. I don't know if he's coming back but this was very useful information. I'm sure he's, he's back. Thanks, Dr. NG. Can you tell us how are you handling the data in Mexico of a COVID study? I, I imagine that this has already been explained. First of all, we will proceed to an overall assessment of the global data. After that, we will have the opportunity of uh, working or uh, processing the data for Mexico, of course, that we are planning to publish, because this is very, very important data that should be disseminated in Mexico. I would like to say that uh, we want this information to be used by policy makers uh, public policy makers, public health policy makers, so that they can decide the proper rehabilitation, rehabilitation and reinsertion measures for the society. I would like to mention the term post-pandemic uh, measures, but uh, I think that we are still far from considering that the pandemic is over. Thank you, Dr. Angie. Dr. Cortez, there's another question for you. What are the preventive health preventive strategies that you have in place preventive strategies right so um as i mentioned uh, when we look at the risk factors there are some risk factors that cannot be changed 
of course, and others on which we can do uh, quite a lot. However, it looks like um, we cannot generalize and say this is a, 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 risk, a generous factors for everybody. And so we will adopt uh, this preventive measure based on strengthening this um, you know, uh, protective factor or um, tackling these risk factors. Because I think what is more and more um, evident from our experience and um, this will uh, be need to be confirmed by the data is that uh, the same factors may be risk or protective factors according to the circumstance, the particular subgroup of the population. So what we really would like to um, uh, have at the end is to uh, understand better uh, what kind of prevention, preventive strategies um, um, governments and policymakers should uh, implement based on the results of COVID, for instance, but in specific populations. So I would say it's quite difficult, I think, to um, list a number of general preventive strategies because, um, as I say, this may vary according to the subtype of the population and also according to uh, the specific geographic um, reality. So, but definitely um, uh, COVID will um, give us a number of uh, clues in terms especially of strengthening resilience and um, so, uh, which I think is important in terms of um, addressing, tackling the psychological impact of COVID-19. And uh, as I was mentioning also, it will be important to understand and to think of the implementation of preventive strategies at the group level uh, as a community rather than just individual uh, factors that may um, target the, the individual as a unique entity. And once again, if uh, Andres and Bernardo want to add anything more specific. Quisieran agregar algo, Dr. Bernardo, Andres? Bernardo, and Andres, anything that you would like to add? Dr. NG. No lo escuchamos. Perdón. <risa> Perdón. Yo, lo que ha sido para nosotros en APM poder participar en. The Mexican Psychiatric Association. Hacer un llamado a los. Bueno. This has been a wonderful experience. And I would like to. Porque esta es la oportunidad de. To say that. This is an opportunity that we have in Mexico of collecting data and compare them to those from other countries. We started a bit later than uh, other countries because of uh, the time it took for us to get the approval of the Ethics Committee. But we would like to continue moving. We would like to ask all of you to disseminate this survey among uh, your friends, relatives, and so on, so that we can collect the data from Mexico and disseminate them. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. NG, we're going to disseminate the information as to how can people participate in the survey. How can people log in to the survey in Mexico? Samuel explained at the beginning how you can have access to the survey. They can log in to our web page and there you will choose the language of your choice and the survey. But you can also log in our Facebook page and there you will find all the information. Another question is, it's a very interesting one. Have you observed any relationship between depression levels and uh, people who have been in lockdown? Depression, depression rates among people in lockdown? Maybe Dr. Medina Mora can answer. Well, first of all, we have uh, a history uh, prior to this because during Ebola, people under quarantine and those who are not under quarantine were compared and it was clearly seen that those who had been under lockdown were more affected by depression. In studies done in Mexico, we have seen that, of course, that the lockdown has exacerbated depression 
and new problems have emerged because people denied having had those problems before the the lockdown and uh, of course that we still need to do more data analysis but it seems clearly that all surveys show the same trend the trend that we saw before an increasing trend in uh, mental disorders but but this is disorders are much more reported uh, now during the pandemic many more people are seeking help many more people are approaching the mental health services which is good because there is a lot that we can do to help them handle fear, anger, uh, and all of these feelings that occur with this kind of pandemic, like anxiety, depression, and distress. They're, they are asking about the informed consent. I think this is a very, very important topic. And uh, I would like to say that ethics committees approve projects and to do so, they first need to approve our informed consent, the one that everyone should sign. Whenever someone is found to be high risk or when someone is seeking help for a mental or psychological disorder, they, re they receive the informed consent and they have to sign it. So treatment can begin once they have signed the informed consent. There is a, a specific process, and I would like to know what is it that you are doing as part of the COVID study with so many countries involved? This is an, the informed consent is a very important condition that we need if we want to do research. Yeah. I would like to know if the informed consent uh, that you need for screening is different than the one you need for to provide treatment. Dr. Cortese. Right, so, um, well, first of all, a clarification, we don't provide treatment with COVID, so uh, it's a consent uh, to uh, participate in the study. And you are right, it's, it's a crucial aspect. Actually, before uh, launching um, COVID officially on April the 1st, um, the central investigators gathered the uh, IRB approval uh, uh, from their institution but then each uh, country, so each um, coordinator for each country has been asked to uh, apply and get, get the approval, the ethic approval from their local uh, national or local IRB ethic committees. Uh, and uh, interestingly, as we can expect, um, different uh, ethic committees have asked different uh, modification and changes. So um, uh, the, the, the survey has been tweaked in different countries according to the request of the ethic committee. So uh, of course, um, it was not possible to launch a, a survey even if anonymous in, in, without this, or uh, in some uh, countries, um, this has been waived according to the local IRB um, rules. But uh, definitely uh, the answer basically to, to cut a long uh, story short is that there's been a central approval, but also we have individual approvals from each of the countries. Um. ¿Alguien quisiera comentar algo más? Pues hacen una pregunta. Anything that you would like to add? They, someone is asking whether they will have uh, access to the data that we have shared or how can people have access to the data that have been uh, mentioned here or will this be recorded? Uh, I believe that this session is being recorded, but while I find out uh, how can people have access to this data, let's uh, entertain other questions. What do you expect uh, from results of the COVID study? regarding the world decision-making process. What do you expect from the COVID study? Right, so once again, I will start and then uh, probably Andres and Bernardo will want to add. So actually, um, when you conduct a study, you can um, either uh, have an hypothesis and test this hypothesis or uh, be more hypothesis-free because you don't really know the answer. 
I think that is a bit halfway. So we will expect, we expect that there will be different risk and protective factors that will vary according to the specific group of the population and different geographic context. And so in turn, this will uh, be helpful for policymakers to uh, implement um, evidence-based um, um, policies in their different countries. Um, an aspect which I think is important also to highlight is that uh, since the um, survey is available in different languages, also people who live in a country, for instance, I don't know in the UK, but um, uh, English is not their first language, they can uh, complete the survey. So we will have also data from uh, ethnic minorities and other groups, and this in turn will be very important to implement specific um, uh, policies uh, concerning also these uh, groups, which is really important. Muchas gracias, Dr. Nick. ¿Quiere decir algo más? Thank you, Samuel. Dr. NG, would you like to add anything? Yes. I wanted to elaborate on the informed consent process. This was one of the reasons why it took us so long to start, because we had to wait and get the approval of our IRB. In Mexico, we have a, a lifeline available for emergencies in case uh, people require uh, mental health care or if they have a mental health emergency. And uh, about the outcomes, as Samuel has said, all of those who work in medicine and are doing science, we would like our policymakers to make evidence-based policy decisions. As Dr. Medina Mora said, since this occurred, we refer to prior pandemics like Ebola and others to see what it was published at those times. We realized that this pandemic was uh, of a greater magnitude. So we are, of course, willing to document in the most scientific way possible what is uh, going on. And that is why this is what Samuel explained. Uh, the major motivation of the principal investigators is not to add one publication to their CV. They really want to make scientific contributions. Many thanks. In the chat, you can find the link where you can have access to this session at the Facebook page at the UNAM School of Medicine at uh, Udual Facebook page as well. So this is for you to check the references that you are interested in so that you can get the information that you would like. Another question reads as follows. Can you tell us about some of the differences that you have detected amongst the healthcare workers and the rest of the population from the mental health standpoint? I would like to tell you about the, our program. The name of the program is We Also Take Care of Ourselves. According to this data, In Mexico, we have had a big impact on our healthcare workers, considering the number of cases and the number of deaths. In our program, the answers that we were seeing sort of did not match what we were hearing in the news or the numbers that we were seeing uh, released. We have an agreement with UNAM, AMIF, and our association to provide care. But we were not seeing the kind of uh, requests for mental health care that we expected. However, in recent weeks, we saw a very uh, important rise 
is the demand for mental mental health care that does match what we see is going on among healthcare workers. Let me highlight that the we the healthcare staff are trained to be able to cope with stress. We saw with worry that we were considering these extremely high levels of stress as normal. That was very worrisome to think that these levels of stress were normal. On the other hand, we saw the accumulation of guilt feeling feelings or anger feelings and uh, some healthcare workers turning to substance use and stigma at times even ourselves who are healthcare workers have the stigma of not seeking proper care in a timely fashion but i would like to tell you that we have seen an important rise in the demand and we are facing a challenging demand right now and we are working on this thank you dr medina mora do you think that the detection of psychological problems among students is more difficult at the time of a pandemic? And they ask where can they get information and the link is already in the chat. Can you answer the question, Dr. Medina Mora? Considering the statistical data, they show exactly what Dr. NG has said. At the very beginning, the healthcare staff was requesting not so much care because, yes, we are trained to deal with stress. There's another study from a network of people that provide clinical care all over the world from 36 countries. All of them are clinicians. We saw the, exactly the same trend with time. What has happened in Mexico is that uh, healthcare workers start to have fatigue. Many people were found to be vulnerable, so they could not uh, continue to go to work. We had a very large number of cases and there has not been proper response. Initially, we felt that only a few were seeking care, but this has been rising. Dr. Rebecca Robles is the one who has done this research. I can share her contact data with you but they have studied the different strategies that they have tested to assist physicians. They've made variations in the offer of the kind of care they're providing, the how to the different approaches to healthcare workers. They have used very, very interesting strategies. They have worked uh, inside the hospitals and so on. They have done a wonderful job. Dr. Robles has done really a wonderful job. This is a collaboration between the UNAM and the National Institutes of Health, the, which are the, the hospitals where physicians are trained. So it would be worthwhile for you to take a look at this uh, study. What we have seen with college students is that uh, many, many of them have uh, sought care. And there are many models that the UNAM has available with the tutors that can identify people who are having problems are not, not uh, seeking care. When they are doing really bad, they seek care, but it takes them long to seek care. This is a characteristic of the entire population. Mexico is one of the first uh, countries in the world where they are referred uh, from the beginning to a tertiary care psychiatric hospital because they don't seek primary care. We found that based on the interventions that can uh, assist us with identifying the college students that need help, we try to identify them through their peers. This is very useful. So our peers, peers help identify 
college students who, who already have a mental disorder from the beginning. We try to identify them right away early on so that they can get the, the right uh, treatment. These interventions are extremely useful so that we can have mechanisms that help us refer college students on time. The nursing school started providing uh, telephone services uh, yesterday. Just, they just began yesterday. So the mental health nurses, and we are collaborating with them at the psychology school. We have a specific, special model for students. Through them, we are trying to early on identify the college students who are at risk. How to provide care to all those who will request it, that's part of the challenge, that's part of the problem. But something that we have learned is that uh, we need to teach skills to students that should include how to seek help, how to seek care. Do you think that students of healthcare careers are more prone to depression? No, statistics don't show that. They do tell us that they have been under very, very complex conditions that other people have not experienced. But we also see how grief, grief affects everyone. Unfortunately, there are many families who have had more than one death due to COVID. And uh, this does not occur only at a single population group. We are worried about healthcare workers because they are at the front line. They are high risk because they practice at high risk areas. They are at risk of getting the disease. And this, so we have to take care of them together with many other problems that they have. The most major problem they have is health related anxiety. That would be my, my answer. Most of the surveyed population is composed of females. Are you going to take a gender based action? Well, this is really something very interesting. There is a survey conducted by Marcela Tiburcio that has to do with uh, substance abuse. She reports that 72% of those who answer the survey are females. There's another survey by Ana Ramos about the coping strategies, the coping strategies or tools that people are using to face the difficult situations. Uh, we had a, a higher response rate from women. We are worried that uh, because males also are facing the same problems, they have a higher suicide rate. So we need to use gender-based strategies. I think that stigma is against males seeking care or seeking assistance. At the psychiatry and mental health service, we do have a gender clinic that is open to address a gender-based violence. And of course, another element of this very interesting question is that, yes, we need gender-based interventions, definitely, because we respond differently, things affect us differently, Violence during the pandemic has been much more frequent among women than males. I'm referring to domestic violence that has affected women much more than males. Many thanks, Dr. Medila Mora. Unfortunately, we have received many, many questions, but we have to close. I would like to thank all of the speakers for their very interesting presentations for entertaining the many questions that we have received. I would like to urge all those of you who are listening to us to please uh, log in the COVID study page and answer the survey. To close, we would like to invite all of you to the network uh, towards uh, opportunities for health 
primary health care a path towards social justice. This will uh, be a virtual lecture for primary health care workers, a, a path towards social justice. This will take place on September 23rd to 25th of this same year, and you can uh, get more information on this uh, web page that you see on the slide. Thanks everyone for participating. Thanks to the speakers for their interesting presentations. We hope to see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Marseillard. It has been a pleasure for us to collaborate from uh, UDUAL and ALAFEM. To close, I don't know if Dr. Roberto Escalantes is with us for closing remarks. I would like also like to thank Dr. Germán Fajardo, head of ALAFEM and head of UNAM School of Medicine. Thank you for organizing these meetings. Dr. Escalante, are you there? Muy bien, pues nos permanecemos conectados. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Que estén muy bien. Many Cuídense. thanks to everyone. I hope uh, you are doing well. Thanks everyone.